This episode is brought to you in part by the American Homebrewers Association, makers of the free Brew Guru mobile app. If you love brewing beer and saving money on beer when you go out, you need Brew Guru in your corner. The app offers a searchable database of homebrew recipes, including popular craft beer clones and hundreds of winning recipes from the National Homebrew Competition. What's more, Brew Guru has a map of money saving deals at breweries, beer bars, and homebrew shops. Grab the free Brew Guru app for iPhone and Android devices and follow the path to good beer. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 23rd, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, members of the Zero Tolerance Gluten Free Home Brewing Club talk about the quickly expanding world of gluten free brewing. I tasted some of their delicious beers at HomebrewCon, and I can tell you the gluten-free branch of homebrewing is really hitting its stride. We'll get some tips from three talented brewers. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewers' logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our new tie-dye silicone pint. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you'd do us a favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leave a nice comment there, that'll help new listeners to find us, or at least that's what they tell us. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. This past Monday, financial subscribers got an early release of the next Basic Brewing video and a behind-the-scenes video with me and my son, Drew, as we brewed a hoppy, amberish beer together. We had a lot of fun, and the beer turned out very well, in my opinion. Uh, the general public will see that episode this coming Monday. And thanks to everybody who's uh, contributing financially. The recipe also went out to uh, financial subscribers, too. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Mark from Bellevue, Washington, writes after hearing the sake beer hybrid episode with Kevin McAvoy. Mark says, first, I was inspired by your Bob Taylor podcast. Uh, that was from many years ago. To make sake over the past winter. By the way, that podcast should be in your top ten and was the inspiration for me to make sake. The sake turned out decent, and I will try again this coming winter. Hint for your listeners that are turned off by the need to put your arm in and physically mix the rice grains by hand. There's a thing known as an electric drill with a degasser attachment or paint mixer. <laughs> uh, I know traditional sake makers don't use a power drill, but it worked for me, and I used to live in Japan, so I know what sake should taste like. Thank, thank, thanks, Mark. Second, I made a moto starter with the Y yeast sake yeast and used it as a base for an anchor steam beer knockoff with northern brewer yeast. Undrinkable, Mark says. After six months in the bottle and very well chilled, I can down a couple of sips. <laughs> so hats off to Kevin McAvoy for getting a good brew out of it. Third, Mark says, my local homebrew shop guy said that he carried the Y yeast sake yeast for a customer that swore by it for cider. Story being, the guy had accidentally smacked the wrong pack in the store, had to buy it, but decided to make cider out of sake yeast, and it turned out great. Mark says, I've used the sake yeast a couple of times for a sizer, and it's been pretty good. Warning that it has a taste that I can only describe as puke for about a month, then it disappears. <laughs> you have to really have to be patient to stick around with puke for a month. Uh, Mark says, I typically use Nottingham for a simple sizer, four gallons with five pounds of Costco honey and two gallons Costco apple juice. And the sake yeast is different, but also comes out as good. Also, the sake Nottingham combination was also tasty. Fourth, anyone having trouble finding koji rice in a Japanese or Asian market can also find it here. And he sent a link to the Pacific Mercantile or Mercantile Company, which is PacificEastWest.com. The Pacific Mercantile Company. Is it Mercantile or Mercantile? I don't know. So thanks for all that, Mark. I appreciate it. I keep saying it's very tempting to make sake. You know, I certainly enjoy good sake. I've had some. Uh, and I'm sure once I, I made it, I think the process, you know, 
wouldn't be as intimidating as I expect, but, you know, just like when I first started all grain brewing, it took me a long time to do that. And afterwards, I was like, what? That was easy. Why did it take me this long? So, hey, when you watch the Basic Brewing Video episode uh, on our father-son Amber Ale coming up, either either you've already seen it or if you're a subscriber, a financial subscriber, you'll see it next week if you're not. You'll see my Poncho's Keg Cooler from our sponsor, Poncho's Brewing Lab. You were supposed to see it in action on the episode, but uh, on the first take, I forgot to turn on one of the mics. So when you see us in the finished version that hits the air, so to speak, you'll see our beers already poured in the glass. So I guess I could have poured out the beers and filled them on camera again or had everyone chug their beers but, you know, that didn't seem like a responsible thing to do in front of my 21-year-old son and uh, uh, Steve's 21-year-old or, or Chase's, what, 22 or 23. Anyway, setting an, an example there. Anyway, the, the Poncho's Keg Cooler is a 20-gallon cylindrical insulated cooler that's, that's designed to accommodate a 5-gallon corny keg. And Poncho made these because he just hated dealing with jockey boxes. Now, I've used mine to serve home brew to family and friends on multiple occasions, and I love it. It doesn't take much ice to keep a keg cool. Um, in fact, I put a couple of bags in the cooler on a Monday, and on the following Wednesday, there was still ice in there keeping the keg cold. It was fine. The beer is nice. And since the keg is, and that's with the, the, the keg cooler sitting out on the hot porch. And since the keg isn't sitting out in the heat like when you use a jockey box, your beer doesn't have to go through big temperature swings. And when you're not serving beer out of it, you can convert your Poncho's keg cooler into a 20-gallon mash tun. And right now, the deluxe Poncho's keg cooler comes with C.M. Becker's mini regulator and adapts to fit 16-gram, 74-gram paintball and regular CO2 tanks for the same price as the deluxe cooler used to be. And if you use the code BBR... At ponchosbrewinglab.com, that's BBR, you can get 15% off any cooler. So head on over to ponchosbrewinglab.com, that's P-A-N-C-H-O-S brewinglab.com, and pick out your own Poncho's Keg Cooler. Promo code BBR. By the way, uh, Steve's son Chase liked my keg cooler so much, he picked one up himself. So there you go. Seeing is believing. I have ingredients for my next uh, homebrew. I'm going to attempt a brute pale ale or maybe an IPA. I'm I'm going to I'm going to see how it turns out uh, to figure out what I'm going to call it. I have the necessary enzyme, and my plan is to uh, start with a 30 minute mash at 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 C, and then raise it to 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 C for an hour after that. And my goal, of course, is to break down the starches in the mash to be very fermentable and really dry out the beer to get that brute style. I've never worked with an enzyme like this, and it reminds me of some of the gluten-free strategies that uh, we'll talk about in this week's show. I have mostly two-row with a little bit of Vienna malt added in the grain bill for fun. I'm hopping with all cascades, and uh, I'm planning to dry hop as well, so... Uh, I hope that this one will come out delicious and drinkable, and I predict a good beer to watch football with or to sit outside in the cool weather that I hope is coming soon on the patio. I'm going to brew that brute beer with my electric Bruna Bank system from our sponsors Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. That system is perfect for a brew like this. In the mash mode, I'll be able to dial in the first rest accurately and hold it without wavering, and then with the twist of a knob, I'll be able to raise to the second rest and not have to worry about overshooting it. Uh, you know, in the past, when I did step mashes in my mash tun, I'd have to calculate the amount of boiling water to add to the mash to bring the temperature up to where I wanted it. And then I'd have to pour boiling water into the mash tun to actually do that. Not only clumsy, but dangerous. But with this new system, the electric system from high gravity, uh, after I complete my mash... I'll just switch the high-gravity Warthog controller over to the boil mode and set the power level to the level of boil vigor that I want. What could be more easy than that? High Gravity not only has brew in a bag systems, they have two and three vessel systems too, all the way from five gallons to two barrels. 
You can see demonstrations of their systems and controllers at HighGravityBrew.com or their YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash HighGravityBrew. Oh, and before I forget, Desiree and Dave were featured on Forbes.com, talking a lot about their background in IT and how it translates into running their business. I posted a link to that article on our Facebook page. Very cool. Um, Check out all the great stuff at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com and use the promo code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your electric brewing purchase. EBC75BB at HighGravityBrew.com. Getting choked up talking about it. (laughs) Okay, let's talk to Joe Morris, Ed Golden, and Bob Kiefer of the Zero Tolerance Gluten-Free Homebrewing Club. I'm here with members of the Zero Tolerance Gluten-Free Homebrewing Club. Here uh, we have Ed Golden. Hello. Bob Kiefer. How's it going? And Joe Morris. Hey, good afternoon. Welcome, guys. Uh, I I was lucky to come across you guys at the at the Homebrew Conference. We've talked about gluten-free brewing here a couple of times, but it's been a while, and the way technology... Uh, and methodology evolve in this hobby. I'm sure lots of things have changed. And I wanted to have you on because uh, you guys just happen to be at the hospitality suite or or whatever they call it uh, nowadays, uh, serving your beers. And I, I think I sampled all of them because they were so good. Uh, and if you had served me those beers without telling me that they were gluten-free, I would not have known. Uh, and there were various styles, which we can get into later on. So first of all, I guess, Joe, do you want to talk about the, the background of the club and how you guys got together? I was diagnosed with celiac about a year ago, um, and I had been a dedicated all-grain um, brewer for seven years before that. Uh, very active in my club um, at that time, PDX Brewers, and I'm still a member of that club. They're great guys. Um, and I was in that club and um, still attending and brewing gluten-free now. And one of the things that I found that was missing from my my home brewing experience was that I could no longer participate in the club in a in a full manner. I could share my beers with them, and they could give me some feedback. But the feedback was always like, you know, it's a clean fermentation. I'm tasting some things here. I don't know what I would change with ingredients because I don't know what you use. And then on the other end, I couldn't drink any of their beers at all. Um, I could drink some occasional ciders from the guys or a mead that was brought in, but I couldn't drink any of their beers, and it was something that I really missed. So I started thinking about it, and I said, well, what if I started a dedicated gluten-free homebrew club where we met someplace, and we're lucky. I live in Portland, and there's there's dedicated gluten-free breweries left and right, and ground being the biggest here in town, I approached them and I said, if I started a gluten-free homebrew club, could we meet here? And they were very excited. They were very, very receptive to the idea. They got behind it and helped me um, push it out there. And I kind of thought it was just going to be me and one of those guys waiting for people to show up. In the first meeting, we had a dozen people. Wow. And started a Facebook page. And I'll say, I think when we spoke with you, um, at HomebrewCon, I was quoting a number of 170, 172 members. And quick check right here, I'm going to say we are over 230 members now just since HomebrewCon. So um, there were people looking for this. They were looking for a place to go and kind of talk about gluten-free brewing because we all, you'll find in talking with us that we all have approach and you know, there's a lot of uh, history there with gluten-free brewing, so we're all trying to figure it out. Um, and it's been a great um, success to me, really. I was surprised at how it's taken off. Uh, I thought that I was going to go to Homebrew Con. It would be me sitting on a cooler with a picnic tap. But I found out that um, Bob was going to be going and giving a seminar. Uh, and I found out, uh, I met Ed through the club. He walked in with a backpack full of perfect beers that he's been keeping to himself the whole time. And, and um, you know, these guys, we all got together at HomebrewCon. We represented the club. We printed up some flyers. We put up a little sign. We brought some jockey boxes. Um, we had a great help from from some of the the commercial brewers here with um, Dan from Moonshrimp. He gave us his jockey box. We dedicated 
gluten jockey box and we just kind of took off with it on that, that homebrew com trip and um it's it's gone well since then i've been really su- surprised at the uh, the immediate success that we've found and ed i guess we should start off by saying that uh you know people are human beings and this is kind of a your mileage may vary situation in that people have varying levels of sensitivity to gluten is that right so there's probably more expert experts on the disease, um, but in my own experience, um, the levels of sensitivity vary. Um, a long time ago, there was a complicated medical diagnostic that they would uh, do an endoscopy and look at your stomach, and more recently, there's a blood test, and it, it sounds like they're starting to find more people, and, and, and uh, across all of that, I, I think we're learning that some people have it severely and some people have it somewhat less so. Um, in, in, in communications with folks, you find people who say that they're sensitive to gluten um, and other people get really, really sick um, from a small exposure. Joe is one of those. Uh, personally, I think I'm in the middle of that range somewhere. Um, to, to complicate matters, the symptoms can be, well, asymptomatic or they can express themselves as issues on your skin or as malnutrition or long-term consequences, the damage to your gut and things. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think your mileage may vary. It depends on your personal experience. But, you know, e- even if it doesn't seem to be really severe, it might be more severe in the long run than you think. And, Bob, uh, I guess we I alluded to the, the quality of the beers that, that I tasted, uh, you know, both at your at your booth at, at Club Night and the booth at, uh, at the hospitality suite. But uh, you and Joe have some kind of street cred. You've uh, you've entered some competitions and you've actually been judged and you've scored well with these gluten free beers. Yeah, uh, it's, been, <clears throat> it's been great. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is, in many ways, in order to become better, you need competition, and that's one of the things that has really taken me to the next level is having somebody like Joe at Heat Web to have try you know, try their stuff see what went right see what you know I, what, what's gone right for me we've gone back and forth on a lot of different things whether it be from yeast attenuation to starting gravities to how to use enzymes what temperatures to use all those different things it's, it's great i mean it really is true you ask three different brewers their take and you get five different responses um and so that's something that's been great you know if if it's all right i i'd like to talk about um something that just happened for me recently um I am really close with the brewers of Ghostfish Brewery uh, in Seattle, Washington. And my second place uh, beer that I, I, I took second place in the Groundbreaker competition to Joe, who took first in that. Um, my recipe, though, they picked it up and they submitted it for their uh, JBF Pro-Am entry. Um, it's, a, it's a Bach and it's, it's really tasty. I mean, in terms of, you know, uh, style, we, Joe and I brewed two different styles, but um, this one uh, I was definitely very excited about. You don't see it too many right now in in gluten free brewing. You don't see a lot of lager brewing, and so it was a a lager. So I'm very excited about it. Excellent, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. So, so Joe, are there are there styles that lend themselves better to gluten free brewing than others? If you're brewing um, all grain millet buckwheat beers, I think that you can find and pretty much get away with approximating any style. Um, I know that. Ed brought a really fantastic um, Hellas to Homebrew Con that I was really impressed with. A little harder to get the darker beer because those those grains don't darken up quite as well. I've had success with red ales and the hoppy beers or hoppy beers. Um, I've scored, I, I think I said I scored like a, what was it, a 38 at NHC with an IPA. Um, and I just entered it straight into IPA. Scored 36 with an amber ale. So these beers, I think that if you're brewing the all grain ones, that you're gonna you're gonna get away with any style. With the sorghum beers, um, <clears throat> fruity hopped beers tend to be something that can kind of mask or even play up that sorghum flavor. Um, or sour beers as well. I've done some some grapefruit sours where you wouldn't notice that sorghumy taste. The sorghum taste is a, a twangy, medicinal, almost metallic flavor that comes through. Um, and when you brew with sorghum, you spend most of your time kind of fighting that flavor. Um, but you can do good dark beers. I mean, that dark ale from Groundbreaker has won numerous 
gold medals, uh, and it's a sorghum-based beer that they that they flavor with chestnuts and roasted lentils, and it's fantastic. It tastes dead on with a a lot of dark ales. So, you know, it, there's there's certain styles that do lend itself better, but when, I think when you're doing the the all grain gluten free brewing, you can get away with pretty much anything. But you can do uh, you can do extract brewing as well. I, I mean, is, is that where people maybe should start or should they uh should they go into all grain immediately and if they're if they're interested in trying extracts what's out there the the extracts that are out there are going to be sorghum and, uh, and brown rice syrup um and that can be found at just about any local home brew store so if that's where you're going to start i mean it does have wide uh distribution it's pretty available it's pretty easy to work with um and you can do some you can do some um flavoring it up with things like lentils or, or toasting some buckwheat or something like that in your kitchen. Um, and it, it is uh, significantly more difficult to brew all grain than it is extract, um, it's, you know, just like it is with with traditional brewing. But there's an added complexity when you're doing it with um, the gluten-free grains because they don't necessarily want to be beer. Uh, you have to coax it out of them. You might do that with enzymes. You might do that with complicated uh, step mash routines. Um, but if I would, you know, we joke a little bit that, that gluten free brewing is four times as expensive and twice as hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it is harder than than traditional all grain brewing. But um, I think that you reap the benefits from it. Um, but yeah, start. Extract, I certainly did. I brewed, you know, a few months worth of extract beers just trying to get the feel for it. And I was I was getting some um, gluten-free malts to flavor them up before I just went, you know, both both feet into the pool with, with all grain. So I know these guys, I don't know what their experience was. Yeah, you guys, Ed, what was your experience? I started out uh, kind of independently, um, benefited from a lot of prior work there's a there's a great body of discussion on, on blogs like um homebrew talk and others um people have gone before us figuring out a lot of things um i wasn't a regular brewer when i started um so i pursued the uh the advice of others and and actually started with home home malting of of chicken feed so i i've i've gone way down the the, the far out path there doing it the hard way Home malting of chicken feed. Yeah, so you can buy millet uh, from feed stores. I don't think it's necessarily intended for people, but uh, yeah, there's instructions online uh, and from other sources. Uh, uh, I think I got it from a, a tutorial produced by an Australian named Andrew Lavery. And uh, there's others uh, because in, across Africa, they, they make different alcoholic drinks with millet um, that talk about various approaches to to malting it but yeah you know because you, you can't it, when i started it was around 2014 and and i wasn't aware of or wasn't able to uh get at that point very easily um commercially prepared millet if it was available i didn't know about it and and bob has the range of ingredients uh available to you guys uh expanded recently and and i, I was talking to one of you guys at the thing about uh, being able to get malted rice, uh, yeah. is that a misremembrance or is that uh, is that right? Yeah. In terms of yeah, when I came on the scene, I I'm a little, I guess I'm I'm before Joe, but after Ed, I guess in the in the downstream there. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that I noticed well, first was obviously the fact that sorghum was super easily available. Same with brown rice, and so those were what really went into the bulk of my first three or four recipes. And then I had a friend who. He always actually, man, he's like, you know, man, I like your beers and all, but there's there's something. He's like, and, and I did some work for you. I actually looked up this website and I found this glutenfreehomebrewing.org website. You should go and check it out. And I spent like probably like 250 bucks on my first go because I was like, oh my god, they've got French roast. Oh my god, they've got chocolate roast. Oh my god, they got they have dark roast. Like every single thing you can imagine now is malted. It's available in millet, buckwheat, and rice. Uh, and it's just impressive. I, you know, the, I think it's, I think their names are Alyssa and Brian over at Gluten Free Homebrewing. They're two of my favorite people <laughs> on the planet so nowadays. And they've been, um, they've been instrumental. I mean, they, they really do a lot of bring all these different maltsters together because Eckert malt, uh, malting uh, is uh, out of Chico. They, they, they make the malted rice that Gluten Free Homebrewing uses. 
uh, uh, Twyla Souls out of um, Grouse Malting and Roasting in, in Col Colorado is also uh, someone who makes a, a millet and buckwheat for that website. But then there's also new malt houses coming coming through. I mean, I've been in a couple of different breweries now where you see, uh, you know, new Colorado malts uh, coming in for like specific like, you know, Kara, Kara Red, C20, C Crystal 40, like all these specific new different types of millets. Uh, it's it's incredibly impressive. So, Joe, you said it's it's uh, twice as difficult and four times as expensive you know, we've we've talked about a, an, an experiment here on the show, and and I and I've talked to uh, professional brewers and home brewers who have used Clarity Firm to take normally brewed beers and take the gluten out, or at least uh, enough to where you know a lot of uh, people who have gluten intolerances can actually drink the beer and not have a problem with it. Why go to all the trouble and expense when you can just buy this clarity firm and fix normal beers? So I would I would probably turn that one around and say, uh, if you can make beers that are scoring mid to high 30s in NHC that are tricking palates like James, um, like, you, like your own, why would you go through the effort of drinking something that's potentially going to have some gluten in it if you have a medical condition? So I, I and the others in the group do have a medical condition that prevents us from, from consuming gluten. Um, Gluten-reduced beers do have some gluten. They do a good job of passing one test. Uh, we've learned about some other tests that are out there that they're not doing such a great job of passing. And then the ultimate test is your own health. I might be able to get away with consuming commercial gluten reduced beers without a reaction. I don't know. I've never tried it, but I will tell you that in the process of cleaning my garage of all the barley dust that was in it, I was getting sick left and right. And there's just no way that as a brewer I could handle 50 pound sacks of barley without inhaling it, getting it in my mouth, getting it on my hands, getting it in my gear and consuming it, you know, um, and getting myself, to have a reaction and it's just not worth it to me. Also, my son is 10 years old. He has celiac disease and we just keep a gluten-free house. There's no way that we're going to bring it into the home. Uh, can I add something to that too, James? Sure. So this is Bob here. Um, the way that somebody put it to me recently, um, it wasn't, it wasn't Joe Red. It was somebody else actually that walked up to me and talked to me about it. It was like, you know, if if I handed if you had a peanut allergy and I handed you a handful of peanuts and I told you that I put a chemical on them that made them not so peanuty, would you still eat it? You know, and, and that's, I think that I think that's the thing that comes into it because you know, as Ed referred to a little bit earlier, yeah, it's a spectrum. I mean, yeah, some people it's going to be a blip. Some people it's going to be three days and they're not going to come out of their house because of how bad the reaction is. I mean, some people have as severe allergies as say people with peanut allergies, where you could have a peanut butter jelly sandwich breathe on someone and give them a reaction kind of a thing. So it's, it's just not, it's just not worth the risk, I think is what Joe's saying. And that's something that I echo too. Yeah. Uh, and if, if the beer's good, if the beer's good, I mean, why would you risk it if the beer is just as good as those beers that are coming out with Clarity Firm? So. Yeah. Here's some food that formerly had poison in it, but I've, I've put some stuff in here that's probably taken most of the poison out. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and now I find it. And I think there's uh, still a lot of debate <laughs> about the lack of science. Yeah. So let's Absolutely. get let's get into the nuts and bolts. Ed, uh, can you talk about? Uh, I mean, you and I spent a, a, a bit of time talking about this at the conference. You guys go to a lot of uh, a lot of trouble or a lot of different things that that we sort of you know quote unquote normal brewers don't have to do. So let's let's start in the in the milling and the mashing and the loudering side of things. What's different? Well, I think the mashing part is different. Um, in, in largest part, the principal difference between the gluten-free brewing all grain and the regular all grain approach has to do with the, the gelatinization temperature and the lack of enzymes in the grains. Uh, we as a group have posed sort of three basic categories of, of brewing, uh, being the kind of extract method that Joe started to highlight. Uh, another one is... Uh, to try to do it a bit more naturally, um, which is a way I have 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 strived to achieve, and, and the third way is to, to obtain industrial enzymes, uh, industrial amylases that will sacrifice. Was well, a tough word there. 
uh, turn the starches to sugar uh, for us. <laughs> the saccharification enzymes, uh, the, the, you know, uh, Seb Amyl L, and there's a couple others that are available commercially that that, that, that are used for industrial productions. But um, so the, the the principal challenge is the, the starch gelatinization temperature of different grains um, vary, and in the case of millet. Um, it tends to range from the the high 138s, uh, 65-ish centigrade, up 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 to around 70 centigrade, uh, nearly 160. Um, and 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 at that temperature, in fact, a lot of the amylase, to the extent that it's even there, is getting denatured. By the time it's fully, um, f- fully soluble for sure. So, um, to make up for that amylase, which is either not present or, or destroyed in that process of getting all of the starches soluble, um, is, is the principal challenge there. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, when, once you get some wort, you boil it and add hops, and it's like everything else. And, and milling is normal, only the grains that are typically used are a bit smaller, so we set our mill gaps down a little. And I think, I think it was you that said that, that, that you can get malted rice, but then to gelatinize the rice, you have to raise it past the temperature that denatures the enzymes that are in the malted rice. So then, <laughs> then you, you know, have... I think that's, that's, that's generally true. I think, uh, for, for millet and I'm less certain of the numbers for rice, uh, or even how much amylase the rice brings to the table, but, but millet has some amylase and I, I find that I get very, 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 if, if I mash in at typical mashing temperatures and do nothing extra, I, I generally do get, a, a clear wort, but but terrible efficiency, you know, fifty uh, percent or something very low like very that. Low like I end up having to essentially serial mash and and do a very large scale, essentially a decoction mash, uh, call it a decantation mash, because I pull all the clear liquid I can off of it, uh, and then heat the 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 cereal until it's gelatinized, and then recombine it so I can recover whatever amylase is in that liquid. Um, if I do that, I get 80% efficiency. Mm. But that extra step is, is complicated and potentially messy um, and adds about a half hour to an hour to my brew day. But other than that, I think um, it's a pretty normal experience. It just takes a bit longer and is a bit more trouble. Bob, can you talk about your experiences? Yeah, so, I mean, on the all-grain side, for me, um, and, you know, maybe this was just because of some early success that I had with buckwheat, I made a, you know, one of my, you know, second attempts at using, you know, partial mash. So like I had used, you know, probably five to 10 pounds of um, grain and then added sorghum and things like that. Um, I had a way high pre-boil gravity, like way higher than I was expecting, like 1050. Um, I had been expecting maybe 1020, 1025. And so this blew me out, I kind of blew it out of the water for me. I was like, well, there's got to be something to these grains this millet and this buckwheat thing so i started playing around with the different percentages now i know that joe and ed have both said like are you sure that's not too much buckwheat and um i responded with hey i've done a 90 percent buckwheat grist all grain before and yeah it was a hard blotter but at the same time it still came out as a great beer i think that what it is is there's you know for me is that yes it's true. buckwheat has a high amount of beta glucan high amount of protein which does create a very gummy texture to the mash sometimes. So what I do is I actually, I actually approach it from the low side. I know that uh, you know Joe and Ed tend to, you know, reach up into the 175, 185 range. For me, I started, I start on the low side and work my way up actually. And you know, it's just kind of how what's worked for me. Uh, I when I first bought my enzymes, I actually bought them from a commercial producer what they were talking about is, oh, hey, you're going to get a lot of great, um, you know, maltose, a lot of great maltotrios, maltotetrios by using buckwheat. You know, don't be afraid of it. We hear a lot of brewers, you know, you know, poo-pooing it, so to speak, but don't be afraid of it. We, we can send you enzymes if you're really having trouble with your lauder and sparge and stuff like that, but try ma- try mashing in at 135 and see, if, you know, for 30 minutes and see if that doesn't help you. And so for me, once I started doing that, I'm, I've, I've, I've been able to bring my uh, mash schedule down to two hours. Um, just because of, on the strength of that beta glucan rest, pr- pretty much alone. So I, I you know, beta glucan rest 135 minutes, 152 for an hour, hour and a half, and then depending on the the grain content, 
because I use a grain father, which is a really narrow, uh, you know, uh, vessel, which, you know, means that I have a very deep grain bed. So I, obviously I'm doing a lot of recirculation. I'm, you know, really allowing the um, enzymes to, you know, potentially reach, you know, as much of that grist as possible. Sometimes I'm even stirring multiple times during the mesh, which a lot of people, I've, I've started to go away from that recently after kind of talking with a couple of different commercial breweries. Um, in terms of, you know, work clarity and finished beer clarity and other things like that. Um, but still, and in, in, in so, I mean, I'm still getting pre-boiled gravities where I want, you know, and, I'm, and I've, I've gotten, I've used seven pounds of millet and buckwheat in total and been able to get 1030, 1035, uh, you know, in a, in a six-gallon batch on pre-boil, which is pr pretty impressive for me, which I'm, you know, something that, you know, definitely. A lot of people, you know, especially myself included, I've used too much grain before and really gotten a lot less extraction, which is kind of interesting because of the whole, you know, one to 1.25, one to one. You know, a lot of people have different varying opinions on how you should do gluten free. Some people say that it should be a thicker mash and then you're washing the grains. Sometimes I found that it more like, a, you know, say if I'm putting seven gallons in the mash ton as opposed to five. I'm actually getting a better pre-boil extraction somehow, um, and that's I, I I think that just has something to do with my vessel. Honestly, my brew vessel, you know, the grandfather is good, but it has its limitations, and so it's you know it's just like every brew house. You have to be able to work within your means, and really find that happy medium that the grain likes. And Joe, what's your approach? Uh, okay, so I'm a, a little bit different than Ed in that I go in hot, similar. Ed, but I am destructive to the enzymes. I just blast right through them and I go in at 185. Um, and then that's how I get my soluble, um, my gelatinization happening there, get all those starches soluble. And I will add um, a distiller's uh, called Termomil that's stable at that temperature. It's stable up to and beyond boiling. Um, and I will, I will use that enzyme at 185 for say 30 minutes or so and start to recirculate things there before I add some cool water and bring it down to somewhere between 155, 165, depending on what I'm brewing. And I'll add um, some, some enzyme that's stable at that temperature for sacrification. And I'll ride that out for say 90 minutes, just, just to be sure that I'm getting all of the conversion that I need. And I'll recirculate for 15, 20 minutes uh, at the end of that mash and I'll, I saw the clearest wort I've ever seen come out of a gluten-free beer. This is something I just started trying. I've played with a bunch of different ways and I've had mixed results. I've had 55% efficiency and then it got up to 65 and then I got up to 85. And then this last beer I brewed, it was in the 90s and I was adding water to try and bring the gravity down. <laughs> so I didn't completely overshoot things. Um, but I think that that's where I'm going to settle right now, uh, at least for now, because it worked for me really well. And I was impressed with with the uh, work there. And that was on a recommendation from some folks at um, Homebrew Talk in the gluten-free forum there. They they set me straight on something that I was doing wrong, adding that thermomill at the wrong temperature. And once I added it at that 185 temperature, which is where it thrives, it just took off for me. So it's a little bit different. Um, Ed calls it cheating because he doesn't like to add industrial enzymes. He likes to do it au naturel. Um, he uses what's uh, recommended by Andrew Lavery, who wrote in 2006 some groundbreaking type of tutorials on how to brew gluten free and how to how to how to um, uh, somebody just rang my doorbell how to um, how to mash how to malt all of those things and we actually have a Q and A on the zero tolerance uh, brewing dot com blog with him we looked him up we found him we found him all the way in Australia and we we grilled him for a little while. Do you need to answer the door? <laughs> I'm going to answer the door. It's probably the neighbor looking for my son. In the meantime, I'll offer that, in my experience, you know, these gluten-free grains, they do have the, the amylase enzymes that you would need to cause the starches to turn to sugar. I'm not, I'm not sure that they have the same profile that barley does. Um, but you can get, I mean, because as I was mentioning, you know, home malting didn't trust the quality of my malts. You know, so so I go through the traditional three steps and and all the rest, um, but I can get by uh, with a with a clear beer that appears to pass the iodine test without adding any enzyme. Hmm. Um, but I, I would comment that um, I find that my beers tend to finish very high. 
um, and I'm, I've been seeking an explanation for that. Um, you may find that when you add these kinds of enzymes, as, as uh, Bob, I think, mentioned uh, in a different interview, they, they tend to finish very dry. So um, there is some uncertainty and some things for us to work out um, about uh, how, how to get uh, all these different aspects of the mash to, to, to work well so we can we can hit finishing gravities where we want them to be, whether that's very dry or um, very full bodied. And I think these different approaches we're talking about are different attempts that all of us are evolving in the part of trying to figure that out. Uh, one last editorial comment I'll make about that. You know, I, I don't think the gluten free hobby is quite as well developed as the, the broader barley brewing is. So you find that there's a, a great deal more varied opinions on approaches and experimentation going on um, in this community, which is something about it that I really like. Yeah, you guys are writing the book as you go along. Well, we're certainly making it up. <laughs> <laughs> as I alluded to before, I had a wide variety of, of beers, uh, you know, through through your booths, uh, including, uh, you know, beers that you wouldn't think would be, you know, nice and, and malty and uh, and delicious, like there was a there was a Hefeweizen that tasted like a Hefeweizen. There was a Hellas that tasted like a Hellas, uh, and then there were hoppy beers that tasted, you know, like norm the normal barley uh, hoppy beers. Uh, do you guys want to pick uh, like a a recipe uh, and kind of you know guide us through the recipe formulation and give us an idea of what goes into making a good uh, gluten free beer? Who who wants to start? Joe, you want to start? Um, well, I'll let you take a pick here. You, you want to go red ale? You want to go IPA? Those are my two favorites. Which is the more difficult? Okay, so the red ale has a ridiculous amount of grain that I get to rattle off. So people like lists of things. I'll give you one of those. Um, so I brewed this beer called Dad's Red Ale because my dad likes red ales. And he comes to visit me often. And I would always brew him um, this red ale that I kind of derived from Jamil Zanishev's, um two red ales he has in brewing classic styles. And then when I got silly, I tried it once with sorghum and he said, yeah, it's good, but it's not quite the same as what you used to <clears throat> brew for me before you got diagnosed. So I, I took that as a personal challenge because he actually bought me my first homebrew kit. So I was like, I got to pay this guy back somehow. So he was coming out. It was a pretty special trip and I was going to show him dad's red ale. And this is a beer that's won the groundbreaker um, gluten-free, the Pacific Northwest gluten-free homebrew club competition, the first annual. And you'll be seeing that on shelves eventually from, from groundbreaker. Um, and this is the recipe for it. All right. So this beer uh, is an American amber ale. It's a little bit more to the malty side and the hoppy side. We're, we're looking to, to accentuate these great malts. Uh, so it's 10 pounds of pale millet malt, uh, one and a half pounds of Munich millet malt, uh, half a pound of buckwheat malt, and that's there for head retention, and a little bit of spicy character. I don't know if you'll get that off in half, half a pound, though. Uh, three quarters of a pound of crystal 10 millet malt, uh, one pound of roasted caramelit malt and this is the flavor that really carries this beer that roasted caramelit has a toffee type of flavor to it uh, is missing from a lot of gluten-free um, caramel malts none of our caramel malts are up in that like 80 or 120 l color but the flavors are there in this and it, it comes in at about 30 or 40 lava bond um, and then i've got um Three quarters of a pound of biscuit rice. Three quarters of a pound of James's brown rice, which is a fun one to say. And that tastes to me a little bit like Special B, uh, even though it's only 22L. It's got that plummy, pruny thing that I was looking for in this beer. Uh, and then there's a little bit of American crystal rice, which comes in at about 16 love, but tastes darker than that somehow. And then for color, I add... Um, one quarter of a pound of chocolate millet, which is 200 love a bond. And all those flavors come together. I know it's a ridiculous number of character malts, but they all come together to make a, a pretty ruby red ale that's got a good, deep, plummy, stone fruit type of flavor to it. And then I just blast it with some pretty traditional hops. Not too hard, though. Um, 
uh, for bittering, this can be a bit of a challenge, but I would say do 15 IBUs of whatever your favorite is. I I use uh, CO2 extract because this beer is all these beers are expensive to brew, and I don't want to lose any volume to bittering hops. So I use just a little bit of of CO2 extract to try and get about 15 to 20 IBUs, and then the hops are all late at 10 minutes. It's half a pound of ca- <laughs> that would be a big beer. Uh, <laughs> half, a hoppy beer. half an ounce of Cascade, half an ounce of Centennial. And then I whirlpool for 30 minutes with half an ounce of Centennial, half an ounce of Cascade, half an ounce of Amarillo, half an ounce ounce of Simcoe. And I ferment it with whatever yeast you're comfortable with, as long as it's clean. It's nothing Belgian or anything like that. But you can use British yeast. You can use American yeast. And um, it's a it's a delicious beer. It comes in at like 6.5% alcohol typically, you know, 1063 starting gravity, 1012 final gravity. Um, and I, I like that beer. I've been, I have it on draft right now. Um, but yeah, give it a shot. Wow. Bob, your turn. All right. Take your pick. I have a, a clone of a, uh, Budweiser style that was released this summer, or I have an extra pale ale. Let's do the extra pale ale. All right. Uh, so it was an all extract, uh, beer. It's what I brewed for uh, one part of my seminar at Homebrew Con. It was, um, I had some generous donations uh, from people like Joe, who had some CO2 extract for the hop side, but um, I used three pounds of sorghum syrup and uh, three pounds of brown rice and one pound of D45 amber candy syrup. And, uh, you know, added at various times through the boil. So I added the brown rice at 60 minutes and sorghum at 15 minutes along with the D45. And then um, I added uh, two ounces of middle fruit at the beginning of the 60 minute boil. And then I added um, various amounts of, I think I had both CO2 extract as well as um, hop, like solid hop of this uh, experimental uh, fruit hop, which is currently being used by um, Ghostfish Brewery out of Seattle. So it was almost a clone of their grapefruit IPA, which is one of their best beers. Hmm. And I, love um, um, I also added uh, a full um, half pound of tapioca maltodextrin, which when you look at it is actually, it looks like it's a lot, but it's super light and it's... Um, it, uh, you, you might want to put it in solution before you pour it into the boil so that you don't get clumps. That would be my recommendation. So the mal- um, maltodextrin is for body? Yeah, maltodextrin is for residual body. All of the aforementioned extracts are incredibly fermentable. I've finished beers at zero, Play-Doh, many times. So I would recommend having something that the yeast actually can't eat or doing something to the yeast that makes it n- – or, or getting a yeast that doesn't necessarily attenuate – too too well right like so say like your typical like you know pacific ale or california ale is going to potentially dry completely out uh, for this type of beer which will potentially make the hops like jump out too much you'd want to dial back if you knew that was going to happen which i have done with a lot of my hopping and it's really helped but um that's neither here nor there i guess for this recipe but um what you can also do which a lot of people do one of two aspects because the sorghum can tend to lend itself a uh, either a metallic or a chlorophenolic taste to a beer. Some people add uh, a 7 to 1 ratio of um, sorghum to uh, pure cane sugar um, in the recipe to really help, you know, play off that taste and and, and not necessarily shine the, the negative aspects. I think the hops in this beer, these experimental um, grapefruit hops were... Um, but really, really generous to the taste. And I think a lot of people at Homebrew uh, Con, you know, mentioned that that was one of their favorite beers. So the one thing about it, if, if your beer dries out too much, you can just call it a brute, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. That's popular now. I think it's all about, yeah, exactly. I mean, beer is, you know, uh, just as much marketing as it is about the taste delivery, too. you gotta, you got to know what it is and, and really tell a person what to expect. You know what I mean? If you've got a bread infection, don't tell me it's a pale ale. 
say it's a Brett Pale Ale. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Entered into the uh, Belgian category. Uh, <laughs> I had the misfortune of uh, judging that category. I think on my first uh, homebrew uh, uh, competition, judging. <laughs> uh, Ed. Uh, were you were your beers that did you have the the Hellas and the uh, the Hefeweizen there that I tasted? I did, I, and I would offer you their a recipe, but the Hefeweizen beer is actually uh, probably more interesting. Yeah, talk, pick 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 a recipe that you you wanted to uh, feature. So I'll, I'll admit that I brewed this beer on a lark um, as an experiment the first time around, and it is in fact the one that I brought to Joe's well, the first meeting that I attended that people really liked, which surprised me maybe as much as everybody there. Um, I learned from maybe it was from Groundbreaker that that they use red lentils. Um, the red red lentils have um, a lot of um, carbohydrate, fiber, uh, and I think this is probably um, oh, and, and a lot of protein, right? And so, so the reason they like to use the protein in the in those red lentils is because it it adds the kind of protein texture that you want for head retention. Um, you can get some of that from oats, but a lot of people who have celiac disease don't um, eat oats because there are proteins in oats that can cause a similar type of reaction. And so, in the hobby, people um, I guess like brown breaker like use lentils for this reason and so i was surprised as anybody that you could use lentils to make a beer and i decided to make a beer with as much lentil in it as i could practically put in it to see what it would taste like and i would call it um a hefe linsen as linsen is the german word for lentils hmm. and so um what i served at um homebrew con um is a, a later more refined version of that beer and it has um red lentils in it like you can go buy from Whole Foods. Um, I put them in the oven and toast them um, a little bit at about 200 degrees for three hours is what I did in that beer. Um, so um, it has about a 60-40 blend of millet malts from Grouse, uh, pale millet being 60% and Munich millet being 40%. I added a pound of the, the biscuit rice you can get from Eckert to give it some kind of bready flavors and, and two pounds of toasted red lentils. Um, and then a little bit of the rice syrup solids to make sure that I hit my boil gravity accurately. Um, otherwise, it, I brewed it like a normal have a Weizen style beer. Um, it comes out a little bit cloudy. Um, but like I say, it's a have a linsen because it's based on lentils. The advice I might give in that case is that the red lentils tend to, to be very foamy and very thick and can cause your sparge to stick. Um, so I add really at least a pound of rice hulls to such mashes to make sure that it runs cleanly. Wow. Yeah, I, ne I never thought I'd uh, have a beer that was made out of lentils, but, <laughs> but it was delicious. Uh, it's a great beer. Yeah, the 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 Hefeweizen that, like I say, the Hefeweizen that I had tasted like a Hefeweizen, and the Hellas was just malty and 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 delicious. And you know the 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 hoppy beers that I had from you guys were just you know amazing as well. So, you know they they stood on on a firm foundation of being good beers first, um, but then you know they had the added benefit of of uh, you know of, of fitting into the zero tolerance. Philosophy, and I guess should, do you, does do one of you guys want to clarify the name Zero Tolerance Homebrew Club? <laughs> I did that just to differentiate us from the fact that we don't accept any barley beers whatsoever. No barley, no rye. We have zero tolerance for it, and that goes down to the yeast. We primarily use dry yeasts, although. I mean, some people are washing <clears throat> liquid yeasts, but no direct pitch, anything like that. Just we try and keep zero ppm on on gluten going into our beers. There's zero tolerance for gluten in our beers, and that was the that was the inspiration there. And we've run into name trouble in the last three to four months, but we're sticking with it, and we're gonna we're gonna hope that somebody else changes, not us. <laughs> I'm stepping away from the mic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, 
Well, guys, uh, this has been fun. And and uh, I guess if, if people want to uh, get a hold of you guys or interact with you or join you, would Facebook be the be the best uh, avenue? Yeah, the club is Zero Tolerance Gluten-Free Homebrewing. If you look that up, um, you'll find us. Um, we also have a, a blog that we're operating, www.zerotolerancebrewing.com. Um, we've got a Twitter feed as well, which is, I believe, Zero Tolerance GF. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that man, we're we're trying to we're trying to move the club along. These guys have been great, active, awesome members of the club. Uh, they were doing their own thing before the club, and they're bringing an awful lot to it. I appreciate it. Well, guys, I, I certainly appreciate all the uh, all the information and all the inspiration. Uh, and uh, I hope that you guys keep experimenting because you know it, 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 if each of you, each of the member of your of your ever expanding group ex- experiments and finds new ways to do things, you know your your knowledge base is going to grow exponentially. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, Ed and Bob and Joe, it was great to talk to you again, and I hope that uh, we cross paths again in the future, and I get to drink more of your beer. Well, we really appreciate your radio show. I've been listening to it for quite some time now, and, and uh, I'm privileged to be a part of it. You know, I'm so glad you came by. I really appreciate the support that you've shown the club, and uh, you've just been awesome with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us on. Yeah. Thanks awesome. so much, Jane. Awesome. Well, thanks again to Joe, Bob, and Ed. I joined their Zero Tolerance group on Facebook. Uh, If you're interested in brewing gluten-free for yourself or somebody you care about, I recommend that you look them up. Great stuff there. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies always coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-tech lagering and decoction mashing and introduction to wine kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our log books where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check it all out at uh, basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.